Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're having a little bit of a technical problem that some people are unable to get access, so we've delayed a little bit to try to straighten that out. We should have that fixed pretty soon. I am Chris Delia, Professor and Dean of the College of the Coast and Environment at Louisiana State University. It's my pleasure to convene this sold-out webinar today in which LSU experts will address the coronavirus issue looking from the perspectives <clears throat> of its likely environmental origins to basic virology and on to the current pandemic. We are recording this, and it will be made available online shortly in case people are unable to get access. Our presenters have a challenge. They need to provide technical details to the professionals in the audience, while at the same time keeping this understandable to the non-professionals as well. Believe me, there will be something here for everyone. So uh, just be patient and uh, something will come that uh, will interest you. I want to emphasize that the opinions expressed today are the personal opinions of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect, reflect the opinion of Louisiana State University. Your audio and video capabilities have been muted to improve the quality of the presentations. The presentations, chat, and Q&A are being recorded. Ask questions via Q&A as you have them. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. Now, this event was originally intended to be the first in a series of activities in LSU's April commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day on the 22nd of this month. I was a participant in the first one as a graduate student. The topic, determined long before the crisis started, was disease and the environment. We repurposed the event to look also at the COVID-19 pandemic, and we postponed the other activities until the fall. But please stay tuned for those, because they'll be great too. To save time, I will let you look through the agenda for today. In brief, we'll be hearing from Dr. Joel Baines first, who will give a general perspective on emerging pathogens like this coronavirus. We will next hear from Dr. Jim Diaz, who will talk about the public health and medical aspects of this, this disease. And we will follow up with a Q&A session led by Dr. Fabio Del Piero. Now, without further delay, I will introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Sam Bentley, who is the LSU Vice President for Research and Economic Development. He's a well-known coastal geologist with interest in sediments and deltas. He will give us a brief introduction to LSU's ongoing uh, response to the coronavirus incident. And he will introduce the first uh, speaker. I will rejoin at the end of the webinar to wrap up and I will give you some additional resources to consult. Sam? Yes, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. So uh, again, I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here. If uh, Kathy, if whoever is uh, uh, at the at the slides, if you can just go in and advance through all of the uh, parts of this uh, this particular slide. So the entire LSU system, and indeed higher education across the state, has been at the forefront of response in a whole host of ways. Just touching on uh, the LSU system, uh, Health Sciences Shreveport is working on expanding medical capacity. Uh, the uh, Health Science Center New Orleans is at the absolute forefront of response down in New Orleans. And we at LSU, uh, A&M and Baton Rouge have been very active. I would say that we probably set a record in terms of being able to stand up a federally and state approved testing facility in less than a week. Uh, and it's now been referred to by, uh, by a number of folks as a game changer for the, for the local testing capacity. And I'm not going to read through this, but we've had, we've had uh, engineers and uh, technicians working to print protective gear. We're developing new, new types of shields that are suitable for, um, for medical use, uh, components for respirators. We've got uh, personnel donating hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of supplies from LSU stocks to support our local hospitals. And we've been developing uh, new and innovative technologies to, uh, to sanitize uh, and reuse 
protective gear in hospitals. So uh, if you're interested in, uh, in contributing to this effort in any way, we've got a, an email address at the bottom of this page. And we invite, uh, we invite you to, uh, uh, to, uh, to contact us and contribute. Now, if we could advance to the next slide, please. So it gives me a great pleasure to, uh, to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. and, and Dean, uh, Joel Baines. Joel is the uh, Dean and Kenneth Burns uh, uh, Chair in Veterinary Medicine at the LSU School of Veterinary Medicine. He became the Dean of the School of Vet Med in September 2014, and he came to LSU from the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine, where he was Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education and the James Law Professor of Virology. In addition to serving as Dean, uh, Dr. Baines serves as the Kenneth Burns uh, Chair in Veterinary Medicine, and he received his bachelor's degree from Kansas State University uh, in, and uh, a bachelor's degree in, uh, in microbiology and a VMD degree from the University of Pennsylvania, followed by a PhD from Cornell in 19, 1988, studying the molecular, molecular virology of feline coronaviruses. He obtained postdoctoral tra training at the University of Chicago, and he's been funded by the National Institutes of Health since 1995 to study herpes simplex virus assembly. His research focuses on many aspects of herpes virus uh, re replication and antiviral therapy, and his work has garnered more than 6,000 citations. Uh, thank you very much, Joel, and I, I leave it to you. Right, thank you very much, Dr. Bentley. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about something near and dear to my heart, namely viruses. And uh, I have to say that in this COVID outbreak, we, uh, and I don't want to downplay the serious of this, this outbreak at all during my talk. I'll be talking numbers and I don't want those numbers to downplay the individual tragedy that people experience when a family member is sick or a family member dies. But public health is a lot about numbers, so don't mistake my reciting numbers as a um, as uh, being crass about that kind of thing. Um, why is public health important? Well, here's a few numbers for you. In a single day in the United States, and this is based on 2018 data, there are 560 cases of childhood pneumonia that are admitted to the hospital. There are 583 cases of breast cancer diagnosed, 890 cases of foodborne illness, 1,900 asthma hospitalizations, about 253 253,000 teens vape for the first time. There are 5.5 million Alzheimer patients, and about 1.6 million people do not have access to the safe water in the United States. And that's not including the, Det the Detroit debacle. And if we talk about worldwide, 411 children died of measles in 2018. Now that's down threefold, the good news, down threefold since 2009, largely because of an incredibly good vaccine that's available for that virus. 1,250 children died of rotavirus. That's mostly in the developing world because uh, rotavirus is a simple diarrheal disease, but if children don't get fluids, they can potentially die from the disease. 2,200 HIV AIDS deaths, and remarkably, that's a 75% decrease since 2009. That's mostly due to antiretroviral therapy. And 37.9 million people around the world are living with HIV infection. 1,150 died of malaria, 3,700 died of TB, and that's falling for about 1% a year for over a decade. So, uh, next slide. It's not working. I hope you heard all that. 
We did. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll try to start this again and see if I can advance the slides now. All right. So um, the outline for this talk will be, um, we'll first talk about the perfect storm that leads to new pathogens um, and really their spread in the modern world. And what is idiosyncratic to the modern world that um, tends to amplify their spread? And essentially how quickly they arise. We'll talk about exactly how new pathogens arise, use a couple examples. And then, so that will be a very dark period of the talk. Uh, it may be very discouraging, but I would uh, hope that you would um, keep in mind that there is a lot of technology that will come to bear. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about a One Health framework that will help frame approaches that may be able to deal with some of these big problems. And then the teams that may, uh, that can assemble based on these present and future threats to human health. So here's a list of recent outbreaks and SARS-CoV-2 is there. That's the agent that, saw, that causes COVID-19. Um, it turns out that all of these viruses, um, these are an outbreak within the last 15 years, about most of these are, in fact, all of them are multi-host pathogens. So they can infect both animals and people. It turns out that about 80% of animal pathogens that these organisms that cause disease infect multiple hosts. So dogs, cats, pigs, humans, um, and about 60% of human pathogens are also multi-host pathogens. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind as we go through some of the specific examples. This is not uncommon, the, thing, the examples I'm going to give you. It's actually the general rule that a given pathogen can in fact infect multiple species. Another thing to keep in mind is if you look at this E. coli here, um, E. coli replicates, at least in, in broth, about every 20 minutes. So that's evolving about 1.9 million times faster than a typical human. So all of these individual pathogens are evolving very quickly. And if you think of it as a, uh, they're looking for the right combination to infect a lot of individuals, either animal or people, to be able to spread very quickly throughout the world. Because that's the one piece of selection that indicates whether they will be successful or will eventually become extinct. So if you look at emerging diseases over time, what you're looking at the upper left here is these are the, a list of emerging diseases by decades. Helminths, these are worms um, and is a small part of the plethora of pathogens. Fungi can be both local like ringworm, but they can also be um, systemic and life-threatening. So that's in the orange here. Protozoa, that's like a malaria. Um, viruses or prions um, are the white, and bacteria or rickettsia is the bulk of pathogens that infect people. So um, if you, zoonotic and B up here are all, oh boy. Gotta watch my fingers. So the zoonotic diseases are diseases that are, are in an animal and that can be transmitted to humans. And you can see all but the black are zoonotic diseases. So these are the ones that actually can jump from animals to humans. We also have, mod in modern world, we have drugs, but many of the pathogens are becoming more drug resistant. That's the white part of this histogram. The black part is uh, the pathogens that are still susceptible to the drugs that we have available. And vector-borne, these are diseases that use mosquitoes or ticks or some kind of vector to actually spread from person to person. And you can see these are a large part of the plethora of pathogens. So um, 
one question that uh, um, you might be asking is why pathogens, why now? I mean, why are we dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic? And why have we dealt with so many outbreaks recently? So I'm going to try and talk about several factors that have led to this um, plethora of pathogen, um, um, pathogens arising. So one thing, of course, is that the world population is growing. And this is projected out to 2050. You can see this is population in billions. The light green are the less well-developed countries. These would be the developing world. Um, and the, the, strug the uh, com countries that are in the uh, extreme third world, back, back, are in, uh, boy, sensitive, um, are um, in the darker green. And that is uh, um, a larger proportion of the final um, population that will be in 2015. The more developed countries, the population is not really growing. And you've probably heard that in certain countries in Western Europe and Japan, actually the population is dropping slightly. So this is a challenge. We have less developed countries and least developed countries comprising the largest part of the future population on the planet. There's also a shift of the, this population into the cities for um, economic opportunity. And you can see that in virtually every area of the world, there is an increase in the population within the cities. And you can see that in the cities, we are a humans are a gregarious group. And you're probably noticing that with COVID-19, you're missing your groups. And that is as it should be. But this is a excellent opportunity for tightly packed humans to actually exchange um, disease. We're also seeing a massive growth in the middle class. So as people move in the cities, they gain more um, um, economic independence. There is an expansion of the middle class. And by 2020, there'll be about 1.2 million billion people that shift to the middle class. Now that doesn't sound so bad. And a lot of but this, by the way, is in India and Asia and other Asian countries. Um, and the EU and the United States is our, will be a smaller proportion because we already have a large number in the middle class. But what happens when you enter the middle class is that people's diet changes and specifically the consumption of meat increases. Um, and you can see by, uh, in this particular slide, um, the gradual increase in consumption of poultry, bovine, pork, and sheep over time. The combined, and if you look at the, this last column on the right, this is the increase in percent in uh, meat consumption throughout the world between 1970 and 2010. And this will only increase, and I'll go show you a graph in a second, the percentage increase, for example, of ducks is 364% increase, goats is 144% increase, um, buffalo, camels, and cattle. Cattle are particularly um, problematic because it takes a lot of land to support an individual cow to get it to produce substantial amount of meat. And if you look at the cattle population worldwide by year, that has gone up dramatically. dramatically. So the combined total of chickens is about 19 billion, cows is about one and a half billion currently, sheep is a billion and pigs are a billion. That's, and all of these are living at one time on the same planet as the people and they outnumber people by about three to one at any one time. Forest land, unfortunately, is decreasing globally. Um, and according to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the single biggest direct cause of deforestation is agriculture. Now, um, we have basically had a percent, roughly a percent plus a little in uh, 
decrease in forest land throughout the world um, since 1990. Um, but that's a lot of land. That's 570,000 square miles less forest that we had. Um, now, a lot of this is because of subsistence farming. So according to the United Nations Framework Convention, subsistence farming is, is responsible for about 48% of the deforestation that we see. Commercial agriculture is responsible for only 32%. There are ways to make agriculture much more um, efficient than subsistence farming. And that, that'll be something that when I talk about One Health teams is certainly a goal for the future. Logging is about a 14% uh, decrease, um, responsible for 14% of the forest decrease in fuel wood removals, which is just uh, basically subsistence survival type uh, removal of fuel for family fires and cooking, um, et cetera, that makes up about 5%. So a change away from subsistence farming towards uh, agriculture could dramatically affect um, forest land. Now, there's also another little bit of good news, and that is not every place are forests decreasing. So in the Middle East and North Africa and in South Asia, um, actually forest land is actually increasing. Um, you may or may not know that when the United States was first settled, most of the Northeastern forests were clear cut, but they have since regenerated. And uh, much of the Northeast is uh, now forested. But you can see, and you've probably heard in the news, uh, a lot about um, Brazilian deforestation. The Amazon, is, people call it the lungs of the, of the planet. Um, certainly uh, there can be an argument for that. Um, but, and there is a dramatic decrease in that, in that forest. So overall, a 1% decrease, but the, where it's happening is, a, is uh, different. So this is something that may be intuitive, but you know, I like to put a little perspective on this. Um, you know, your grandfather, or at least my grandfather, uh, was English and basically did, uh, you know, his, his trip to, town or to the village or his long trip for vacation um, was pretty short. Stayed within the continental England there. And uh, um, it was, uh, I'm sure he had a great time, but um, he didn't go very far. <laughs> so, um, but you know, my father or, uh, or your father had more opportunities. So uh, was able to go to Europe and uh, continental Europe, Portugal, Italy, you go to the good places, Portugal and Italy. I'm sure Dr. Del Piero appreciates that comment in France. And, um, but the sun can virtually, can go anywhere in the world overnight. And that is amazing, an amazing fact. Think about that. And when I show you this picture, um, and I hope it works, worked in the practice. So what you're looking at, all these little dots, is a single transcontinent, is a single flight um, by a transponder in a um, plane. Imagine in 1908, there would be a little blip over in South Carolina where the Wright brothers had a single flight. This is a hundred year difference and these almost look like bees, and you can see the line of uh, the sun um, right there, moving from right to left over the ocean now. All those transcontinental flights have landed in the morning in England, and there's fewer flights leaving from the United States. It's night in the United States, and those will gradually increase. Just imagine the effect on the planet of the difference in the last 100 years that this has made. So not only do planes take people, which are potentially vectors, but they take plants and then they take animals and they take seeds. And all of these things and viruses, of course, are in those seeds and, pretend, and attached to those plants and in the water that goes from one place to another. Another perspective to think about is, you know, modern humans have only been here 
about 200,000 years. And um, that the planet is 4.54 billion years old. So um, we've been here about 0.0044% of the planet's lifetime. So if you put that another way, if that time was measured in a football field with one end of the world, uh, one end at the start of the world and the other end, um, the end today, life has been going for 92 yards, but people have only been here for the last 0.16 inches. So this is a big change and I haven't even done the calculations on how long we've had intercontinental flights. So when we talk about vectors getting back to this perfect storm, what when we take water from one place to another, it can bring mosquitoes. So now we have um, Al Aedes albopictus in the United States. It wasn't native here, it was brought here. And this carries Zika, chikungunya, and dengue virus. We have ticks. This, is, uh, this happens to be the deer tick. This carries Borrelia, which is, causes Lyme disease, bacterial disease. And of course, you've heard a lot about cruise ships, but cruise ships not only bring people, which um, can be infected with various diseases, but there is a lot of bilge water in a cruise ship. And you've probably heard about zebra mussels invading the Great Lakes. That was due to bilge water in ships that carried those mussels, which were native to um, Europe to um, the Great Lakes and became a great uh, problem, both with plumbing and the ecosystem in the Great Lakes. And of course, I already talked about airplanes. So I'm gonna give you a few examples. And as I'm going through these, think about how um, the world changed to basically cause this to happen. So the first thing I'll talk about is Japanese encephalitis. So um, this is a little piece from uh, Open Magazine by Ratna and Irani. I'm talking about Japanese encephalitis virus in the middle of an outbreak in India. And quote, thousands of years ago in the forests of Indonesia, JEB lived with its friends, the ancestors of the pig and the egret. JEB or Japanese encephalitis virus visited the pig and the egret by hitching a ride with a mosquito. You could say that JEV's life was spent traveling from one friend to another, and it didn't possess a home of its own. So in this kind of environment, degraded environment, normally that pig, uh, this pig and this egret have contact and really had no contact like this before, at least certainly not this frequent of contact. Normally they would be in the forest, in separate ecosystems or rarely transmit this virus. You take, obviously with this type of virus, um, in this type of environment, clearly this is man-made, this is a um, waste uh, uh, depot. Um, humans are responsible for this, but also nearby. So since we've introduced humans into this environment and increase the likelihood that pigs and egrets share the same mosquito, the mosquitoes bite humans. And Japanese encephalitis virus is now endemic in India in 1995. It kills 10,000 children a year in, by encephalitis with 50,000 cases. In 2005, between July and November, 5,700 children were affected and 1,300 died in Uttar Pradesh alone. And although this is probably an underestimate because it's difficult to, to diagnose without laboratory testing, approximately 70% of the people who actually get signs um, have either, either die or long-term neurologic dis disability. So this is a flying fox. Many of you know this particular creature. This is actually a pet in some parts of the world. They're actually quite intelligent. They're fruit eating bats. Um, 
The thing is, though, uh, they are very intelligent and they will find food where it is um, and will actually move um, from places to places to find uh, appropriate food. So what happened in Malaysia was there was a, uh, their particular, um, their favorite food uh, didn't fruit in a particular year. So they moved into barns and orchards and uh, kind of housed in the barns nearby those orchards. And then bats defecate and bats defecated into the food troughs of pigs. And those pigs then ate the feces, became infected, and a subset of those pigs um, uh, were able to infect people. Very inefficient. It killed only 100 people with 300 human cases. Um, and it was a mild disease in pigs, but this devastated the Malaysian pork industry for years. And it cost them billions and billions of, of dollars, sorry. Foot and mouth disease. This particular epizootic came from probably initiated when a um, someone illegally ported, imported meat through the cater, catering industry, port, um, followed by feeding of uncooked offal from uh, the meat that wasn't eaten to pigs. This caused 2,000 cases of the disease. Um, across farms in the United States, in, the, in Britain. The rule is, and the way you control this kind of outbreak, this is a very bad virus because it's a little bit like COVID-19 in that animals do not show signs for a while, yet they're shedding virus. So, and it's a very tiny virus. Unlike COVID-19, it can shed by aerosol for miles, depending on the wind. So, um, 2,000 cases, um, it, over 10 million sheep and cattle were killed because there had to be a large subscribed region around the individual cases that were identified. The UK was able to eradicate it again from the island, but it cost 16 billion US dollars and many farmers were devastated because their long lines of cattle were lost. Family legacies were essentially uh, eliminated. There's a interesting documentary that Dr. Delia um, uh, shared with me about the meat and animal farms in cities, and maybe he can give the link to that towards the end of this. Um, this is a big business in China um, and uh, some other Southeast Asian countries. So farming formerly wild animals for meat is uh, a very big business. Um, this particular, I showed this, I've been showing this slide for about three years, this uh, to my veterinary students. This was uh, responsible for SARS and SARS actually was kind of the progenitor, a different virus, but a progenitor of what was going to happen with COVID-19, which probably originated in the same type of markets. And it killed, SARS killed about 870 people, just 870. But the containment um, was a cost about forty billion dollars. So, where do new viruses come from? Now, as a virologist, I just have to give you this little fact. You know, each mill of ocean water um, contains several million viral particles, and if you add up all the mills of ocean water, that means there are 10 to the 30 virions in the ocean. If you line, virions are very small. They're only a, uh, a thousand coronavirions can sit, fit on the head of a pin. But this is the rule of big numbers. 10 to the 30 means if you took all the viruses in the ocean and lined them up, they would stretch 200 million light years into space. All right, so there's a lot of viruses. But fortunately, most of them aren't infecting us. But here's a couple. So influenza is uh, um, a very important pathogen. And you can see here's the replication strategy. Now, for 
illustrative purposes, the artist here has increased the influenza A virus by about 1,000 fold. So imagine that 1,000 fold uh, smaller. But there's a couple features I'd like to show. One is entry, which is at the very beginning of this. Uh, on the upper left there, there's a little piece coming out from this. This is a cell you're looking at. That's the surface of the cell where the virus is attaching. That attachment is a receptor, that protein. Now that protein was not designed to attack, track viruses. It's just a protein that the cell needs to use to survive and communicate and do what cells do. But viruses have pirated that and used that as a receptor to bind to specific cells. So um, the concept of individual receptors will become very important in Dr. Diaz's talk later. But on the upper right, look at how it is born. That's a new virus being born. And there are all those little blue things in the middle. If I touch this, it's going to advance the slide. So I can't do it, sorry. Um, oh, if I'm very careful, I can. No, I can't. So all those little curly cues in the upper right, there are eight of them. Those are segments of the viral RNA. So those are the things that are the genetic material that allows that virus to propagate itself at the end. So, um, and all of these segments have to be in that particle for that particle to actually work to infect a new cell. So flu is um, capable of uh, replicating very rapidly. We put thousands of particles for an individual cell. And the thing is, because of its segmented genome, so if you imagine this human virus has a segmented genome and all eight segments are red, and you have a pig virus where all the segments are actually yellow, it's possible that if you co-infect the same cell with both viruses, as a virus is born, it might grab one segment from one and seven from the other. This is how we generate a new virus, potentially, in the case of flu, where you have a segmented genome. Now, coronaviruses, it's called corona, by the way, because of this, these, these petal-shaped protuberances, which are the receptor binding proteins protruding from the surface. Um, it reminded the microscopist of a corona, uh, a crown, or a corona of the sun. On the right, you see a cross section. There's no segment here. There's just a single RNA, okay? How could that possibly become new? I'll show you pretty quickly. So here's viral RNA, it enters the cell. We skip the entry part. So we just have that viral RNA that's uh, entered the cell. It's translated into a protein called the polymerase. This particular polymerase is the target of antiviral drugs that are candidate drugs that may eventually um, defeat this particular virus. The polymerase jumps over to the viral RNA and then it copies it. And so we end up with this yellow strand, which is the new RNA, and that's going to be the template. Now, this is the key to this particular virus's. Uh, how shall we say, ability to change so quickly. There's a bit of a, as we start to make this copy again, so this is the template RNA, we have to make viral RNA by copying this. We have a little leader, a little section at, the, at this end that is made, and then remarkably, and this is unique in biology, this particular species or this group will actually let go of that viral template and will join its new template. It's either that RNA or a different RNA um, to finish its replication. Now, sometimes it doesn't jump, so that'll make a full length. But at the end of all this, we make shorter RNAs some of the time. And so we end up with this group of RNAs and these smaller RNAs make individual proteins. The larger RNA is the virion RNA and that gets packaged into the virion. But by its nature, this polymerase jumps. 
jumping polymerase. And this jumping polymerase will actually, if you infect a cell with two coronaviruses, say one from a pandolin, which is uh, also called a scaly anteater on the left and a bat on the right. And if you um, co-infect the cell, the polymerase from the pandolin virus can easily disengage from that during the course of its normal replication and accidentally engage the bat virus. So we end up with a hybrid. The left side is green from the pandolin virus, the right side is beige from the bat virus. So we end up with potentially an entirely new virus. And we call this a copy choice mechanism. It's like the, um, it's copy, uh, it's, it's copy because it's all due to the polymerase and the polymerase chose to, um, uh, chose its different template to make a copy. So we call it copy choice. So that's how we end up with a new uh, coronavirus, um, potentially. In addition, you and I, we are kind of, we're kind of DNA or, uh, oriented or dominant. Every time our cell replicates, there are all sorts of checks and balances to make sure there are no mistakes, because we don't want mistakes that can potentially lead to uh, detrimental effects like cancer, for example. So there are a lot of checks and balances to make sure that um, that particular um, replication is correct. If it isn't incorrect, the cell will either immediately die or the cell has machinery that recognizes the incorrection and corrects it. Viruses don't have that. They don't have enough intelligence, if you will. They don't have enough DNA to encode all that DNA replication or RNA replication machinery. So um, they make mistakes. So a typical HIV replication, for example, there are one or two mistakes per genome. That's why in an AIDS patient, the viruses that are in the brain are different from the ones that's in the lymphocytes because there is a constant checking of the code. They're constantly looking for that perfect uh, combination that allows them to survive in a certain niche. This probably happened with the coronavirus, COVID-19, in which there are different mutations that happened after we recombined between the pandolin and the bat. We inserted um, several amino acids in the spike protein that allowed cleavage to be much more efficient. So that actually increased transmission. And those were all point mutations that happened after that original recombination event. So with all these strings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and I, um, my father was a, a PhD in theater, so pardon the pun, uh, Will. I feel like I know uh, Mr. Shakespeare very well. Um, what can we do? So for, first of all, we are a resilient species. We, um, have we learned from our mistakes like no species on the planet? Just look at what happened in Philadelphia in St. Louis. So why do you think this was the co this was the pandemic in 1918? In Philadelphia, there was a um, a troop uh, rally um, that um, was uh, happened right at the teeth beginning of the pandemic in Philadelphia. The mayor said, "Let's go have it." And we had this massive peak and hospitals were overwhelmed. In St. Louis, the mayor said, social distance, stay in your houses and look at the difference. I mean, and this is, the, this is basically the template that we're using to um, understand how to deal with the current outbreak. So we learn from our mistakes and we're good at it. The second is the march of technology has dealt with so many problems that were in, viewed as insurmountable in the past. Just look at this list. Smallpox killed, had a 30% mortality rate. COVID-19 is about 2%. It was eradicated in 1980 with a vaccine. Rabies is a, was a scourge. It still is a scourge in some parts of the world where the vaccine is not applied on a regular basis but the vaccine was very effective in 1888. Lister introduced the concept of hygiene for surgery in the 1890s. 
that saved countless lives, not only in surgery, but this idea of hygiene has saved countless lives um, throughout the world in various different contexts, because now we know that germs are actually susceptible to detergents and disinfectants. 1923, we discovered insulin, allowed a treatment for diabetes. 1928, penicillin, just in time for World War II. 1950, canine distemper, 10% of dogs per year died every year from canine distemper. That vaccine set the path for measles vaccine. They're in the same family, different viruses, but, and one does not infect the other, but it set the pathway for um, um, the measles vaccine, which is invented in 1971. Both incredibly good viruses, 99.99% effective. 1954, polio vaccine, open heart surgery in 56, the rubella vaccine in 68. The genetic basis of cancer, so now we can think about curing cancer by altering oncogenes. There are genes in the body that actually prevent cancer from happening, and those can, we can upregulate as a result of what we of this understanding. Our first engineered mammal for studies was in 74. In 1974, also monoclonals were invented. And so this was done just to figure out how antibodies arose. But it turns out that it's led to a technology which allows us to make any, any antibody we want in very quick time. So all of those drugs that you see on TV that are, anti, uh, that are somewhat immunosuppressive, psoriasis treatment, et cetera, any drug with an MAB at the end, that's a monoclonal antibody that arose from this technology. Ivermectin, huge, parasit parasit infection are huge, and especially in the developing world, this essentially wipes them out right now. In 1985, Chris Moeller, in a dream, um, envisioned the polymerase chain reaction. This is a reaction that allows you to amplify any nucleic acid sequence. To, um, in a, to very high levels. This is the basis of all of our COVID-19 tests. It has completely changed forensic science. It's actually hard to um, commit a crime uh, anymore because largely because of polymerase chain reaction and goes on and on. I will say that um, the, $1,000 mammalian genome, you know, when Craig Bettner sequenced his own genome, it cost $100 million in 2001. Now it's 1,000, and in 10 years, it's going to be $100. So what that means is that every patient will potentially have their DNA sequenced. That allows individualized medicine to be tailored to individual issues and individual problems. For example, um, we know that some people seem to be highly susceptible. It's, it's age, but there seem to be other things involved to COVID-19. If we had the sequences, we could actually mine that data and figure out where the differences is and potentially repair it because of gene transfer and gene therapy. In fact, and those are the things I know about, okay? so. Every scientific field has advanced to an ever-increasing pace. We met, were able to map um, the COVID-19 origin by geospatial imaging, um, basically in a heartbeat. We had the sequence of that virus within three days of the first case when it was finally recognized this, this was a novel virus. Medicinal chemistry, this is the study of how you change medicines so that they're more bioavailability or they're repurposed. So you've heard about hydroxy, um, um, I'm having, a, anyway, the, <laughs> the drug uh, uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, that hydroxychloroquine is different from chloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is better. That was a medicinal chemist who had that added that hydroxyl to increase bioavailability and increase the effectiveness. And look at what we have done potentially for the planet. Many of these have yet to be realized substantially,
but solar cell development, battery improvement, communication and information sciences, we knew instantly that there was a problem in China. Imagine it if, if that had happened in 1908. It's very different. Management of big data is a huge thing as well, because all that sequence data, all this ocean science, all this ecology, all this geospatial imaging, all that has to be managed and interpreted. We're now able to do that. That is a huge advance in computer science and a very important area of investigation. So this One Health framework is about healthy people, a healthy environment, and healthy animals. And if you think back on those outbreaks that I talked about, one of those things led to problems in the other two. So this, this, these are interrelated in a very um, intimate way. So um, these teams um, are, uh, have a great potential for dealing with some of these big problems. So this One Health has um, been, is been a long time coming, frankly. In 1902, Virchow recognized the link between human and animal diseases, said, wow, these lesions are the same. Osler, the father of veterinary pathology, was uh, worked till 1919 and 1947, Veterinary Public Health Division was established at the CDC. In 2007, the AMA passed a One Health resolution promoting partnership between veterinary and human medicine. And in 2008, FAO, WHO, UNICEF, all in the World Bank, all banded together to form a joint strategic framework in response to the, this increasing risk of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. And in 2008, One Health became a reality. And in 2009, the One Health office was established in CDC. Now CDC and realizes that it, not every outbreak requires all of these people. But let me give you one example. You know, if you just had a uh, physician who goes into an Ebola outbreak and says, I'm going to fix you wearing a white coat and a hazmat suit, that's not going to be very effective. Really, what the, uh, because they don't understand the culture. They have to work with the local leaders. Otherwise, they're a stranger. There have to be anthropologists who can inform about the culture. There have to be local leaders that become involved. There have to be epidemiologists to help us understand really what are the rules um, that the virus is using to transmit from person to person. Turns out e Ebola is fairly easy to control if you work with local people because um, other than the funeral rites, which are very dangerous in this case, and that is a major a discussion that has to happen with sociologists and, um, um, and, and anthropologists with the local leaders. But the virus is only spread from people who are essentially bleeding. So, um, and people are good at seeing people that are bleeding. So it, they're easy to avoid. COVID-19 is much more um, subtle, let's put it that way. Um, so each virus has its own set of people that must be, in, must be involved to help solve the problem. And think about hydrologists and engineers. These are long-term issues. I mean, how can we ensure that the water table uh, does not keep dropping so that people are forced to go towards the forest in order to get food and wood to keep contacting animals that they would not normally contact? How can we use ecologists to understand um, what is the difference between a healthy landscape and an unhealthy landscape? Ecologists are very good at finding links between different parts of a, of a um, landscape and essentially an ecology that, allow, that will inform all of the others so that we don't disturb this delicate balance that we call health. So some of the challenges in the future are, um, how do we ensure food security for a growing population? Does that population have to grow? Biosecurity, um, detection and vaccines. I should say that, you know, we will have a vaccine of COVID-19 um, really very quickly. And probably 
uh, 15 months because of the incredible technology that's coming to bear on that uh, particular. There are pl plenty of ways that any virologist worth their salt can think of in a heartbeat. Getting it through the testing and making sure it's safe is another issue that takes longer, but it will certainly be done. So um, genetics of disease, I talked about this. Um, we will be to the point where we can pretty much predict how you will respond to a given disease at any one time. And of course, all these other uh, issues too. So I would say, you know, as you're social isolating and keep your chin up, you know, there are a lot of people working on this problem and we will have a solution. And it's going to seem like forever, but in that geologic span of time, it's really less than a blink of an eye. So stay safe. This is going to pass and we're going to be healthy. So, and we'll be able to have uh, all our parties, et cetera. So I thank you very much. And I think my chore is now to, or my pleasure, I shouldn't say chore, sorry, Jim. <laughs> Uh, my pleasure is to introduce uh, James, Dr. James Diaz. So he's a professor of public health and preventive medicine and director of environmental and occupational health sciences at the LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. And he has, uh, um, has an MD and a master of public health and a doctor of public health, all from Tulane University. And he's very interested in occupational and env environmental toxicology infectious diseases, poisonings, injuries, and international travelers, very pertinent here. Emerging environmentally associated diseases and poisonings. Remember I told you a lot of the diseases are, uh, we have a lot of people who don't have safe water. And uh, that is an engineering problem that needs a lot of attention, or certainly more attention. And finally, the impact of climate change on natural, natural disasters and their public health outcomes. So I give you Jim, I, I hope this works. Hi, everybody. Um, unfortunately, I can't um, log in and see you in person. I, I hope that you can, can hear me. And uh, our slides are already uploaded, so I'm going to go on ahead and start the slideshow with the first slide. And the topic is going to be first SARS. That was our first experience with a beta coronavirus. And then MERS, uh, which really sort of missed us in the United States. It was confined to the Middle East, although there were a few cases around the world that still occur. And now we're in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Next slide, please. The World Health Organization has uh, changed the name from the original 2019 novel coronavirus. And the virus itself is now known as sars CoV-2 because it is genetically related to the original SARS virus, which caused an epidemic in 2002 and 2003. The disease that's caused by SARS-CoV-2 is called COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this is what I'd like to talk about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on zoonotic diseases because you heard that from Dr. Baines a little bit about the molecular biology that we know a lot about thanks to SARS because it'll help us with a vaccine. Uh, we'll talk about the prior pandemics of beta coronaviruses. I'll give you today's best update and I'm already behind because when I last checked about uh, nine o'clock this morning, we were about 952,000 cases worldwide and approaching a million cases worldwide. We'll talk about the Chinese cases we know a lot about the first thousand Chinese cases. We'll talk about the index case, uh, the first case in the United States in Kirkland, Washington. We'll go through the clinical course, a little bit about diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and control. And then uh, 
an important part is uh, basically uh, based on the questions that you submitted. We'll talk about what to do if you're pregnant, pets, where to, what about wearing masks, uh, what about ibuprofen. So we'll talk about that in a special topics section, and then we'll talk about what's new, what we're learning that's very new. And then lastly, we'll talk about myth busting and what we don't know, and I call that the no gap. Next slide, please. So you've heard a lot about Spanish flu, and I'm gonna go through this uh, slide pretty pretty quickly. Uh, what are all the nurses uh, wearing? They're all wearing masks. Uh, you don't see too many men in this uh, image because they're all overseas. So in the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, an estimated 500 million people were uh, sickened and killed uh, an estimated 20 to 50 million, including 675,000 Americans, many of whom were, were soldiers. And what you see is basically what's happening now. People are wearing masks, theaters and businesses were closed, events were canceled. All of that sounds familiar. We still don't know exactly what strain, but we suspect an avian flu strain, H1N1. If we look a little bit more closely, where did the epidemic originate? It didn't originate in Spain. The only reason it's called the Spanish flu is because Spain was not involved in World War I. It didn't have a news blackout. And Spain was hit hard by the influenza epidemic of 1918, 1919. And that's where the name Spanish flu came from. And Spanish, Spain is being hit hard next to Italy right now with the COVID-2 um, epidemic. So it actually came from, from the US and allied troops were moving across the world in crowded ships and the ships acted just like incubators for the virus. Does that sound familiar? How about the cases on the, the Crown Princess and the, the other ship? More soldiers and, and sailors actually uh, were killed by the flu than were killed in battle in World War I. So let's look at some of the similarities between the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918-19 and the current uh, epidemic that we have now. All began as diseases of animals that um, Dr. Baines discussed. The Spanish flu, in birds more than likely. This one originated in bats more than likely. We still don't know what the intermediate animal hosts are. Uh, they're transmitted by respiratory droplets. Bread begins initially as animals to man, uh, maybe in the farmer or the individual who's raising the animals for market. Then that individual spreads to his family. Many of the family members may serve as vendors in the, in the wet markets, in the animal markets in, in China. And the next thing that occurs is person-to-person -person spread, first at the markets and then in the community alone, uh, all become highly contagious. Uh, patients will present with low-grade fever, just like influenza, a dry cough, some shortness of breath, and dyspnea or difficulty breathing is what dyspnea means. And complications of both flu and COVID-2 include pneumonia and respiratory failure. Prevention still includes all of the things that we saw originally in 1918, including social distancing, self-isolation, quarantine, masks, personal protective equipment. The case fatality rate, which is what CFR stands for, differs. Spanish flu was around 10%. H, uh, H1N1 flu that we had here a few years ago, 3%. SARS, 2002, 2003, 10%. MERS, very high case fatality, 30%. And then the novel COVID-2, uh, which we have now, probably less than 1%, but that's in all patients who become symptomatic. What about the case fatality rate in patients who are elderly or patients who have coexisting morbidities? It's elevated. In fact, the case fatality rate right now in all is the highest in the nation. It's over 4%. Next slide, please. A little bit about the molecular biology, and I think Dr. Baines uh, covered this, and we we'll basically just look at the image. Uh, and there, there are four genera of uh, coronaviruses. Only two affect humans, alpha and beta. The alpha ones are the ones that cause the common colds, so about 30% of colds. And uh, the beta ones are the new ones, and they include the SARS-CoV-1 
and its relative, the new one, SARS-CoV-2, as well as MERS, or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. So these are the beta coronaviruses. And the other coronaviruses, the gamma and delta, they cause diseases in, in animals. So I call your attention to that spike protein, which is called the S protein on the uh, capsid or the envelope covering uh, of the uh, coronavirus virion. And that's important because the S protein or the spike protein is the way that the virus attaches to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. And these receptors are located all over the respiratory tract in the lungs, they're in the heart, they're in the gut, they're in the kidneys, and they're responsible for a lot of symptoms. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. This slide just shows a close up of that spike protein connecting with its membrane receptor, the ACE2 receptor on the membrane of the alveolar cell in the lung. This is important because we will be able to produce monoclonal antibodies, which Dr. Baines addressed, that uh, could be used to treat the disease, as well as get ideas about vaccines that are aimed at preventing the entry of the virus into the lung cell. And this is the type of vaccine, the spike protein vaccine that's being tested in Seattle right now. Next slide, please. The next slide is really a review of the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is kind of complicated, but I'd like to just go through this with you quickly so you know what these receptors are and, and what they do. And we will revisit this at the end when we're talking about what's new. Uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, we call it ACE2, is an enzyme that is spread throughout the uh, membranes of the cells in the lungs, arteries, heart, kidney, and intestine. This is why you see a lot of the symptomatology in COVID-19, including uh, renal failure. ACE2 serves as a feedback break on the renin angiotensin system. That's very important uh, because when you lose ACE2, because it's bound by the virus, uh, it may not be able to serve as a feedback break. Angiotensin 2 is bad because it's the one that raises your blood pressure. So it's why we have angiotensin converting enzyme blockers. They block the cleavage of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and reduce your blood pressure. So that's exactly how the ACE inhibitors work. ACE1, everybody wants to know what ACE1 is. We're all the time talking about the ACE2 receptor. ACE1 is really important because it catalyzes the breakdown of bradykinins, which is an inflammatory mediator, primarily in the lungs but also in the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And I don't know if you know anybody who's on an ACE inhibitor, but some people suffer from an agonizing cough, or some people can have swelling in their face and throat and lips and have to switch to another drug, like an angiotensin receptor blocker. So that's called an ARB, and an ARB occupies the very receptor that the COVID-2 spike protein wants to attach to maybe these drugs could be protective. Next slide, please. Let's go through the beta coronavirus epidemics now quickly. As we said before, the first one was called SARS. SARS stands for Sudden Acute Respiratory uh, Syndrome, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, primary reservoir in bats. They are super spreaders of the disease, which means that they can spread the disease to more than one or two people. And we also have super spreaders of COVID-2, which we'll talk about. Symptoms include fever, cough, dyspnea, diarrhea, significant diarrhea, and respiratory failure. Mechanical ventilation was required in a large number of patients. There was nosocomial spread, which means spread in the hospital. Uh, and the outcomes were bad. The case fatality rate was around 10%. Fortunately, this didn't hit the United States as, it hard, as hard as it hit uh, other parts of the of the world, including Europe and the Middle East and Canada, actually Toronto uh, had uh, several cases and Vancouver as well, with a lot of healthcare uh, providers who died in the SARS epidemic of 2002-2003. Next slide, please. 
the next experience we had with the beta coronaviruses was really in the Middle East, and it was called MERS, or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Virus. We think the primary reservoir was bats, and we know that the intermediate uh, host animal were camels. And uh, the symptoms were significant, and they included very severe diarrhea and renal failure and respiratory failure. There were super spreaders again. There was no community spread. The disease was very bad. Half of the patients, or even more than that, had to go on mechanical ventilation, and the case fatality rate was extremely high. Uh, MIR still occurs periodically throughout the world, but it's primarily confined to the Middle East. This is our current experience. Our experience now is with the SARS-CoV-2 beta coronavirus that causes the disease COVID-19. The index case was in the city of Wuhan. Wuhan is a huge city. Uh, I've talked to somebody who's visited Wuhan who says it's absolutely beautiful. It's as big as Los Angeles. It's got a population of 11 million people. Uh, again, we think the primary reservoir came from bats. We're still not sure. I think Dr. Bain showed you a picture of that uh, uh, anteater, which is, you know, actually um, a, a, um, a threatened uh, species. Um, the incubation period, we're getting closer and closer to knowing the exact incubation period. It looks like it's three days. I'll tell you why in a minute. And the symptoms of disease and the symptomatic, asymptomatic, of course, had no symptoms, low-grade fever. Viral diseases typically don't cause high fever. It's up 103, 104, like bacterial disease. Low-grade fever, 100, 100.5. Cough, dry cough, scratchy throat, sometimes shortness of breath. Uh, painful breathing, potentially complications include respiratory failure. And important to say, some patients, including the index case, had mild diarrhea. And that's because there are so many ACE2 receptors in the gut. Renal failure can occur, particularly in the elderly, for the same reason. So many ACE2 receptors in the kidneys. Person-to-person -person spread, as we talked about, and then community-acquired spread, and then nosocomial transmission, in the hospital to healthcare workers. Mechanical ventilation in 10% or less, particularly in high-risk patients for elderly or have comorbidities, <laughs> especially, especially hypertension and diabetes. Um, outcomes we'll talk about in a minute, and we've talked about the case fatality rate. If we look at all comers, case fatality lower than 1% with COVID-2, probably around 0.66%, but higher in those individuals with high risk factors. Next slide, please. This is just a picture on the right of what you can get at the West wet markets in, in Wuhan. I guess you can get just about anything you want. You can get a uh, live snake, barbecued snake, fried snake, just about anything uh, in, these, in these wet markets. And some people say, well, why do they call it West Mar wet markets? Well, they, they also, um, you can also buy uh, fresh fish and live fish in these markets too, and I'll show you a picture of that in, in a minute. But we know that the coronavirus epidemic that we see today began in the large city of Wuhan in Southeast China, and we know that it started from animal to man, then man to man, and then community spread and nosocomial spread. One of the problems early along in Wuhan was this virus entered the population at a very important holiday time. It was the beginning of the new year. People were traveling throughout Southeast China and all over. Uh, people were coming to the United States and elsewhere. And that's how our first case got here. So the travel ban uh, which restricted incoming flights from China was very important at protecting the United States. Just a little about the molecular biology of SARS-CoV-2. It, of course, is an RNA virus like all of the other beta coronaviruses, all of the coronaviruses. It's got the spike protein that attaches to the ACE2 receptor. We now realize that there are two strains. The S strain is the older or ancestral or Chinese strain. It's the most common strain still, but there's a new strain called the L strain. 
if you if you get sick with COVID-19, you want the L strain because it's the L strain that is um, is probably um, I'm sorry. You want the S strain because the S strain is probably um, the more severe strain, while the L strain is probably not as severe a disease. And somebody says, well, why do you have mutations that cause viruses to develop uh, a less severe type strain? And the reason is viruses are parasites. They, they don't want to kill the host. Uh, they want to parasitize the host and, um, and live on the host for as long as possible. We have both strains in the U.S. now. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit about the spread, which we've already talked about. Uh, you, you can see that you can buy, uh, uh, you know, a cattle a cattle head um, in the um, in the markets in in Wuhan. This is a picture from the uh, markets at at Wuhan. And um, as I said, all of the beta coronaviruses probably had their origin in bats. And at the market, you can see this image, and this is an image from the uh, the live animal market in Wuhan. You can uh, get your bat, you know, any way you want it, uh, a live bat or a barbecued bat, but you can buy these. And this is really a delicacy uh, in, in China and, and other parts of the world. Uh, interestingly enough, most of the patients in Wuhan uh, did not get their disease because they visited the market. Uh, neither did our index patient, which we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of the seafood that you can buy at the wet market, and you can see that the fishmonger is in, in his uh, booths uh, selling basically whatever you want. You can buy live fish as, as well. Now, at the bottom of the slide on the left is the bullet point, which again is going to be out of date. So go to your Johns Hopkins website, which really is the best one. It's an interactive website which gives you uh, up to date uh, stats about the COVID 2 epidemic. And at the present time, we're approaching a million cases worldwide with 50,000 deaths. Chinese cases uh, have uh, settled down 84,000, 3,400 deaths. Uh, cases in, in Italy are still. Uh, being recorded 110,000 with 13,000 deaths. And on the next slide, um, we'll, we'll look at um, uh, U.S. experiences uh, after we talk about Chinese cases. So these are the cases, the first 1,000 cases in China. These were the cases occurring before we had any cases here in the U.S. And the median age was 47 years of age, which is pretty young. 30% uh, had gone to Wuhan. Incubation period was about four days, and that certainly matches with what we think the true incubation period is today. 43.8% presented with fever, but more than half didn't have fever at all. They may just have had a cough and a scratchy throat. 5% went to the ICU, 2.3% needed a mechanical ventilator, 1.4% died. Uh, the conclusion in China was their rapid spread, varying severity of disease. There were few findings on the chest X-ray. I'll show you a picture of what the chest X-ray looks like. And more than 50% of patients had no fever when they presented, just a scratchy throat and maybe some difficulty breathing. This is our experience to date. And if you go on the Johns Hopkins site, the U.S. now is 216,722 cases with 5,137 deaths in the U.S. The problem here is that the Johns Hopkins site is very up to date and the CDC requires further confirmation. So if you add up the numbers reported that are travel related, person to person transmitted, um, and persons under investigation, for example, even if you include those, you're not going to get to that number 216,000. If you look at the map, however, you'll see the epicenters. I don't, I don't think you can, no, you can't see my, uh, my cursor, but you can see the biggest bubble is over New York. The next biggest bubble is over New Jersey. Uh, we're a pretty big bubble uh, in Louisiana, 6,424 cases, as is Florida and uh, 
California. Next slide, please. This is the flattening the curve slide, and it shows the impact of the measures, measures taken to slow the rate of infection. And they appear to be working. Social distancing, um, staying at home, avoiding uh, large uh, group gatherings of 10 or more. And what this is designed to do is to slow the impact on the healthcare system so the healthcare system can actually take care of the sickest patients. This is an important slide. This is a new slide, and, and I hope you have this one. Is everybody uh, familiar with what happened to the uh, Corral group in the Seattle area? Well, they decided last month that they should have a choir practice and uh, get out of the homes and get together. 60 members of the choir showed up and had a choir practice, and somebody uh, described a choir practice. It seemed like a normal rehearsal, except that choirs are huggy places. We were making music and trying to keep our distance between each other. Uh, after two and a half hours of practice, the singers parted way at 9 p.m. Three weeks later, 45 were diagnosed with COVID-19 or were ill with symptoms. Three have been hospitalized and two are dead. So what this told us is that the preferred mode of transmission is not by fomites, which are inanimate objects like a doorknob, but by respiratory droplets. And number two, the incubation period is about three days. So that certainly um, equates with what the Chinese experienced in the first thousand cases of an incubation period of four days. So this was an important, although a tragic, um, case cluster of disease. Next slide. So who are we going to test? We want to test everybody, but there's still not enough tests to go around. So what the CDC and others have recommended and what we're doing in Louisiana right now is certainly any of the clinical signs on the left side of the slide and healthcare workers who have come in contact or are symptomatic. Um, next, patients who are symptomatic and have a history of travel uh, from affected areas. We have a travel ban on the most effective areas, but maybe people can enter the company, the country through different areas, like you can fly from, uh, for example, uh, China or Japan to Mexico and enter the country through Mexico. And then finally, anybody who's symptomatic with no identified source of exposure. So soon, hopefully, uh, we'll be drive-through testing uh, all of these people, certainly, who are symptomatic and anybody who wants to be tested. Testing is important because what does testing tell us? It tells us how to practice stay at home even better because then we'll know who is COVID-19 positive and totally asymptomatic yet still communicable. So we need to know that information and the sooner the better. In fact, in Singapore and South Korea, they tested a lot earlier and were able to determine this earlier and they were able to almost flatten their curves uh, close to a straight line. So these are the test kits. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the uh, test kits. Um, and now we have proprietary uh, companies like Quest and LabCorp who are making test kits. So hopefully they'll become more available than the original CDC uh, test kits. This is an interesting slide. The next slide, um, this slide is the slide of a super spreader. And remember we said that ordinarily with the coronaviruses, one person transmits the disease to one to two other people, usually family members, caregivers. Super spreader spreads the disease to more than two. So this is an index patient who came from Wuhan and went to attend a meeting in Germany. I want to say Munich, Germany. I'm pretty sure Munich. And uh, at that top line where it says index patient, the patient visits Germany in January. And then around January 22nd, 
goes back to Wuhan and has symptoms on the plane. And later, around January 26, 27, tests positive for the virus by the confirmatory test preliminary chain reaction, or, or reverse transcriptase PCR. Patient one is a patient who was at the business meeting with the index case from Wuhan. Patient two also attended the meeting. Patients three and four are patients who had contact with people who attended the meeting. So this is, this is how you can see the super spread phenomena of CoV-2. This is the first case in the United States. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it. So next slide. The chest X-ray of the first patient is on the right. This is a healthy young man, 35 years old. He didn't go to the wet market in Wuhan. He just visited friends and family. He didn't have any contact with anybody who was sick. As soon as he got back to his hometown, just north of Seattle, he had uh, low-grade fever off and on, and he had a dry cough. So he went to the urgent care center. Uh, fortunately, they had anticipated um, that uh, something was going on in China. They isolated the patient, uh, did a chest X-ray, did a nasal pharyngeal and an oral pharyngeal swab, both of which came back positive, sent the patient to the hospital for isolation. So. By the 19th, the patient is hospitalized and doing pretty well. But by the 24th of January, all of a sudden, the patient's transcutaneous oxygen saturation in room air dropped from normal of around 96, 97 in room air to 90%. And they were very concerned and rolling up a ventilator next to the patient's bed. And some astute clinicians um, ordered a chest x-ray, the patient had what looked like community-acquired pneumonia. They started antibiotics for community-acquired pneumonia. Um, he was still not doing well. Oxygen saturation had dropped significantly. Uh, they decided to start um, the drug, new drug designed for Ebola called remdesivir, and the patient got better and didn't have to go on a ventilator. So this was the first case that we learned something from. This is the uh, ICU chart of the patient that I'm gonna kind of skip over, but I just wanted to point out on this uh, clinical course chart, this is basically a copy of the bedside chart of the patient in the intensive care unit. Uh, the patient did have fever off and on. The patient had cough throughout the disease. The patient had a runny nose at one point. Fatigue or malaise is common. The patient did have nausea and vomiting for a period and also had diarrhea and abdominal comfort for a period, discomfort for a period. And people said, well, we didn't think that was gonna happen. But remember earlier we said, there are a lot of ACE2 receptors in the gut and that SARS and MERS in particular were characterized by severe watery diarrhea and potential uh, hypovolemic dehydration. So this is the chest X-ray um, that we see in patients who are progressing to pneumonia. And on the right, uh, in, the, in the far right panel, you can see a left lower lobe pneumonia that you can actually see better on a CT film. But what happens is you may present with a low-grade fever, scratchy throat, dry cough, maybe some difficulty breathing. And then about day eight or 10, uh, if you are elderly or have risk factors, typically uh, that's when things can turn bad. And at that point, you have very difficult breathing, shortness of breath, and you may have evidence of pneumonia, viral pneumonia initially, that could be super infected with bacteria uh, on the chest X-ray. And these are the patients who end up requiring mechanical ventilation. And even further, if mechanical ventilation, uh, which is on, on ventilator, and um, it's difficult to maintain patients on ventilators, it's a very uh, labor intensive, you need plenty of medical personnel, highly trained personnel, and it's very uh, resource uh, intensive. And uh, if 
the patients cannot be weaned from mechanical ventilation. Some hospitals have resorted to uh, advanced support, and this is advanced support right here showing a machine, and this machine is actually an artificial lung, and that is called an extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. So uh, this is extremely um, uh, expensive. Uh, I, I would imagine that Medicare and Medicaid would pay for it. Not many hospitals have the capability for uh, ECMO. So this would be the most advanced form of support for respiratory failure, other than a lung transplant. And these patients are not uh, in a condition to undergo a lung transplant. At the present time, there's controversy about whether or not to transplant kidneys from a patient who's died of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there is um, controversy regarding whether or not to use that kidney. Many, many want to use it, but others uh, warn that we know that there are many ACE2 receptors in the kidneys. So these are just some of the laboratory findings of which there are not many. The most important laboratory findings are a drop in the white count. Uh, that's what lymphopenia means, a drop in the lymphocyte count. But what's most important is at uh, mid-infection, the liver function tests do go up. The transaminases, which are biomarkers of their enzymes, and they're biomarkers of liver damage. And the point here is very important because when we get into special topics and talk about ibuprofen, um, you may not want to use Tylenol or acetaminophen to bring somebody's temperature down who already has some evidence of liver insufficiency. It may be safer to use a drug to bring the temperature down like ibuprofen. So we'll get to that when we're into special topics. Radiographic findings are not much early along and later can look like a mnemonic picture. And on this slide, under radiographic findings, COVID-19, uh, you see bilateral viral pneumonia, and you see it better on the CT scan than you do on the chest X-ray, because you get a really good look behind the heart. And you can see the famous box signs that are showing you uh, the consolidation of uh, pneumonia in, in both uh, posterior lobes bilaterally. Now, we'll talk a little bit about treatment, and I know that Dr. Baines mentioned some of this, but uh, I'd like to go through the available medications that we think might work and why we think they might work, and some have indeed worked. But number one, there's no specific antiviral drug yet uh, that we have for SARS-CoV-2. Although antibiotics uh, are ineffective against viruses, Remember, the index patient uh, was treated with cefepine, which is a cephalosporin, and vancomycin for a presumed community-acquired pneumonia or superinfection. So the patient may still need antibiotics, even though we know antibiotics don't work for viral diseases. There is an exception, and that's called azithromycin, um, or the ZPAC, the famous ZPAC, and it is a type of antibiotic, but it's also an antimalarial it's actually a very good anti-malarial, and it has been combined, combined with chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, and hydroxychloroquine as well as uh, chloroquine. And uh, we think that these drugs uh, work through a different mechanism, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that mechanism in a minute. But the next slide is a slide called Treatment to Isolation. And this is isolating the patient in the healthcare facility and providing all of the appropriate personal protective equipment for the healthcare providers, some of which are now in, in short supply and some providers are having to uh, reuse N95 uh, masks and other um, forms of personal protective equipment. The bottom bullet on the slide, isolation, actually shows the risk factors for progression to severe illness. And it's important to review these. Older age and underlying chronic medical conditions such as lung disease or COPD from smoking, cancer, hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, renal disease, liver disease, diabetes, and anything that compromises your 
immune status, such as HIV AIDS or having an organ transplant or being on chemotherapy for cancer. Again, this is a picture of supportive uh, treatment with, um, uh, again, escalating from oxygen therapy to mechanical ventilation to extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, which is the artificial lung. These are the antivirals we have, and IVIG stands for intravenous immunoglobulin. Remdesivir, as I said earlier, was developed uh, as an anti-Ebola drug, and uh, it, it was used actually on the index patient, but you cannot get it now because the company that makes it is actually um, conducting clinical trials of the effectiveness of the drug in Wuhan, and they've enrolled 1,000 patients uh, sick with COVID-19 uh, and 1,000 patients uh, who are treated with remdesivir to see what the, what the outcomes are with remdesivir. Maybe you've heard that the survivors of COVID-19 are important for us. They're important for us because after a certain period of time, they form antibodies. And we can actually take their blood, give them their red blood cells back, and spin down their plasma so that we have a plasma that contains a lot of their antibodies, which we call a hyperimmune globulin. And we could actually treat patients with transfusions of these um, immunoglobulins, which are actually antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And identifying the antibodies is important because we want a vaccine to stimulate the formation of antibodies. So as we, as we learn more about the IgG antibodies that form, we'll learn more about being able to treat the disease with intravenous administration of hyperimmune globulin, and we'll learn more about making a more efficacious vaccine. Incidentally, uh, IVIG for infectious disease uh, was used successfully to treat uh, patients with severe West Nile virus disease or neuroinvasive disease and to treat patients with Ebola, uh, and it was used effectively. Next slide talks about the anti-malarial drugs, and I know that Dr. Baines mentioned these, and those of us who are in tropical medicine, uh, we, we know that chloroquine and hydro hydroxychloroquine well, chloroquine doesn't work at all because the most uh, malaria carrying, uh, most plasmodium species, well, all species are now resistant to chloroquine, uh, which was the original anti-malarial drug. Hydroxychloroquine is um, probably a more effective and safer preparation of um, chloroquine, and it has been used to treat uh, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis effectively. And uh, these drugs, specifically hydroxychloroquine, but also chloroquine, have been combined with azithromycin in uh, treating severe COVID-19 disease. And the mechanism is probably the same mechanism that makes them effective in malaria. And that is they reduce the cytokine storm that happens when the virus enters the lung cell. What happens when the virus enters the lung cell is lysosomes uh, basically um, release all of their chemicals called cytokines, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and these can cause further inflammation and damage to the lungs. And this is why we think these drugs are important. Uh, next slide just uh, shows that cytokines can also suppress uh, T cell. Uh, activation, uh, which triggers the lysosomes to, uh, intracellular lysosomes to release their chemicals, which are the cytokines that can cause further damage. So this is how we think the antimalarials and the antibiotic, one antibiotic, Zithromax or azithromycin work. And this is just a cartoon of how we think these uh, antimalarials work inside the cell. And this is a graph. The next slide is a graph of a patient from China who was actually given uh, a combination um, of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And 
the how the PCR positive um, test for the patient uh, dropped quickly when treated with this drug combination. Now, if you're being treated or you we don't recommend self-treatment, although a lot of doctors and nurses are self-treating themselves right now with combinations of either hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin or combinations of both drugs. Um, but here's a terrible, tragic case that many of you have probably heard about that occurred last month in Phoenix, where a gentleman and his wife took some commercial preparation of chloroquine that was designed to treat uh, tropical fish disease and the, the gentleman died of uh, cardiac arrest on admission to the hospital. So you certainly want to be taken. The drug, these drugs uh, were developed as oral drugs, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, so you certainly don't want to be taking some sort of commercial preparation of chloroquine made to treat fish disease. So in summation, the next slide is called the summary of therapeutic options and it just puts everything together on one slide, and it shows at the top uh, the CT scan, the axial CT scan of bilateral uh, posterior lobe pneumonia in a patient with severe COVID-19 uh, who is either, at that point, I don't see an endotracheal tube, but uh, uh, probably getting close to going on a ventilator. On the left of all are all the supportive things that we can do, temperature control, analgesics, IV fluid, uh, different ways to administer oxygen all the way down to the, the heart lung, well, the artificial lung machine called ECMO. And um, the, um, the right side of the slide goes through all of the drugs that we've talked about. Um, although I didn't mention uh, for community-acquired pneumonia, we typically use cephalosporin and vancomycin, and those were administered in the index case. And then for viral pneumonias, uh, these are the drugs that have worked. We talked about remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, zithromycin. Interferon we haven't talked about. I don't know if it's been used, but we didn't talk about the anti-AIDS drug called lopinavir ritonavir. Uh, and that is a combo drug used in highly active antiretroviral therapy for uh, HIV positive patients. And we think that it works by stopping viral replication in the cell. That's how it works in AIDS. And that's how it probably works for um, the coronavirus, COVID-2. Next slide. The next couple of slides just go through prevention. And we've sort of talked about that. And um, this is one from Wuhan, W for wash hands, use masks properly have temperature checked, avoid large crowds, and never touch your face with unclean hands. And this was, I just thought it was a nice um, way to remind the general public what they needed to do. The next slide called Prevention 2 just says the same thing, avoid touching eyes, nose, mouth, close contact, large crowds, remain six feet away. Some people say six feet, why six feet? Well, because we've had movies of patients coughing and sneezing, and under slow motion, we can actually see the path of the respiratory droplets. And at about six feet out, they'll drop to the ground. I've got sort of a pet, pet peeve about coughing in your, uh, in your elbow, because what are you coughing into? You're coughing into your shirt or coat, which is a fabric. And uh, a fabric could retain the virus for a longer period of time than a flat surface. So yeah, I recommend that you cough or sneeze into a Kleenex or a tissue and then discard it and, and wash your hands. Uh, the next slide begins our special series on special topics. And this actually came from a lot of the questions that you all submitted. We talk about pets, pregnancy, fomites. Remember, fomites are inanimate objects like a doorknob, hands, masks, travel, quarantine. Sports, send the kids out to play, ibuprofen. We had several questions on that. And then what's new and then what's wrong? So let's go into that quickly. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Baines covered this in great detail. Your pets are not a problem. Even though the disease probably originated in bats and there are certain intermediary reservoirs like the camel for mirrors and the civet for SARS, and we're not sure exactly what it is for uh, COVID-19, 
Maybe it's the anteater, maybe it's a snake, we don't know. So pets are not a problem. Pregnancy, patients who've been pregnant have gone through the pregnancy with no problems. Some have become COVID-19 positive and have had normal newborns. The problem with, not a problem with pregnancy, but in pregnancy you are somewhat immunosuppressed, so you don't form an immune reaction against the haploid number in the fetus, because remember, half of that comes uh, from the father. So in pregnancy, by definition, there is some degree of immunosuppression. And this is one of the reasons why patients who were pregnant were at great risk of getting viral pneumonia during the H1N1 epidemic a few years ago. So we, we would recommend that it's important for patients who are pregnant to protect themselves from um, sick people, practice social distancing, avoid big crowds, uh, and restrict travel away from home, certainly long air travel or cruises, things like that. How long can COVID-2 survive on surfaces? Can't answer that completely, but there was a good study in Germany, probably from hours to days, depending on the type of surface. We just talked about cloth. You could probably stay in cloth with all these little uh, interstices uh, and cloth. You could probably stay on cloth a longer time than it can on, on metal or, or plastic. Um, what is gonna kill it? Well, what kills the virus is what dissolves the outer glycoprotein coat. And that is 0.1% sodium hypochloride, which is Clorox, or 62 to 71% ethanol, which is ethyl alcohol, or isopropanol, which is rubbing alcohol. So you wanna be uh, over 60, 60 to 70% alcohol. Now, a lot of the Lysol products uh, do contain uh, either sodium hypochlorite or alcohol or both. So you have to read the ingredients, but you want, you want sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, and you want ethanol or isopropanol. So what happened next? Well, it caused people to say, what about methanol? It's an alcohol. What about ethylene glycol? Well, it's antifreeze. Yeah, it's an alcohol, but I don't recommend that at all because they don't work. And methanol doesn't work, and, ethanol, and, ethyl, and ethylene glycol doesn't work either. Uh, methanol is highly toxic to the eyes because it's metabolized by the alcohol dehydrogenase system uh, to formaldehyde and formic acid, which can cause blindness. And this happened during the prohibition era of the 1930s when people were making bootleg alcohol. So methanol does not kill the virus and it can make you blind. Uh, antifreeze does not kill the virus and it can kill your kidneys. Next slide. How long should I wash my hands and how often? Well, to be honest, hand washing is better than those hand sanitizers. Wash your hands often uh as soon as you come in contact with other individuals when you're being outdoors whenever you sneeze or blow your nose before you eat after you use the bathroom wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds uh warm water is a little bit more comfortable uh than very cold water or hot water uh if you can't wash your hands with soap and water use your hand sanitizer make sure that it's got 60 plus percent either ethyl alcohol, which is ethanol, or rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol in it. Should we all wear masks like they do in China? Maybe so. We haven't gotten there yet. We just don't have enough masks to go around. 3M is gearing up to produce large numbers of masks. Even the guy who makes those my pillows is making masks, which is amazing. That's great. Um, who really needs to wear a mask right now? The people who need to wear masks are certainly all healthcare workers, and they need to wear different types of masks, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And somebody who's sick, so certainly if you're sick with a cold or the flu, or I hope that you don't have COVID-19, you're sick with COVID-19, you should be wearing a mask. Uh, and the people who are close by you and who are taking care of you, they should wear masks too. So what kind of mask to wear? Well. If you are self-isolating at home, a regular surgical mask, uh, like on the top, is okay. And you'll see on the right, a surgical mask combined with an N95 mask. 
Now, an N95 mask has a special filter in it. On the top, you can't really see the filter, but you could feel it in the middle. Uh, and then on the bottom, on the bottom um, of the of the image, you can see a filter uh, that's more on the outside of the mask. But these N95 respir respirator masks, they are indicated for people taking care of COVID positive patients in the hospital, in ICUs, in skilled nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities. And these are the respirator masks that will actually filter out the virus. They're not made for reuse. So we certainly need to produce more of them. And, and I know that people are reusing them uh, right now. Okay, I already wear glasses. So why do I need more eye protection anyway? when screening patients with uh, under investigation or caring for patients with COVID-19. So we get asked these questions by EMTs and nurses all the time. And here's the reason why you need an eye shield as well as your eyeglasses. And that is the eye sockets are directly connected to the nasal cavity by the nasal lacrimal ducts and the nasal pharynx, the nose, they're filled with ACE2 receptors. So the typical way for the virus to first enter your body is through your nose. That's number one. The next way the virus enters your body is through the mouth. So that's why you need eye protection. Travel bands, we talked about travel bands earlier and, and they did protect us, but they're not going to, uh, basically um, it's the disease is going to spread because of, of earlier uh, travel-related cases, and you saw the travel-related cases that occurred in the United States earlier. And remember, our index patient in the United States had come from Wuhan back home, he's an American citizen, back home to his town just outside of Seattle. So travel bans are, are important, uh, but now that we have person-to-person -person spread, the, the coronavirus is, is here now, and it's spreading um, it's spreading despite earlier travel bans. How about sending the kids outside for a pickup game of flag football or basketball? Not a good idea. Any basketball player who has to stay more than six feet away from his or her opponent is not a good basketball player. So contact sports are probably not the best exercise for the kids. They can go outside and ride bikes, jump on the trampoline, um, they can go jogging, running, uh, walking. Don't drink out of public water fountains, sounds like the polio epidemic. Um, and uh, take off your dirty shoes before you re-enter the household. Okay, what about ibuprofen? There were a lot of questions about ibuprofen. Um, ibuprofen, which is Advil and Motrin, 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 and there are many, many forms of ibuprofen. The WHO initially recommended avoiding ibuprofen um, because it may increase ACE2 receptors in animal models, but then they reversed themselves and said ibuprofen is okay. Ibuprofen is a COX-2 inhibitor. It is an NSAID, which means it's an anti-inflammatory agent. It brings the fever down and it's an analgesic for pain relief. It also inhibits the T cell response that triggers the internal release of those cytokines from lysosomes that cause further damage to the alveolar lung cells. So ibuprofen may be a better choice than acetaminophen to treat patients with fever and um, COVID-19 disease, especially if their liver function tests are abnormal. Next slide is what's new. So we're gonna, this is the last part. We'll go over what's new, and uh, I'll just give you the bullet points quickly on the left. Increasing reports of loss of taste and smell among young survivors. Tell you why. Two, increasing reports of acute renal failure in COVID-19 patients with severe disease requiring mechanical ventilation. I'll tell you why. Three, geographic mapping of COVID-19 to some countries producing commercial crops of tomatoes. That's weird, but it was referred to me. And four, did you know that tomatoes, kiwi fruit, kiwi fruit and walnuts are ACE inhibitors? Let me talk about that. Loss of taste and smell. Remember earlier we said 
that the nasopharynx, the nose, the throat, the tongue, they're filled with ACE2 receptors. This is where the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the body. So it's not surprised, it's surprising to see a loss of taste and smell uh, in survivors. Fortunately, it resolves over time. Acute renal failure. I had a report from uh, intensivists who called me and said, we're seeing acute renal failure in our patients on the ventilator, especially those patients with car cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Now, they may have had some pre-existing renal insufficiency from diabetes and or hypertension, but we're beginning to see acute renal failure. Why is this? Remember, the kidneys are full of these ACE2 receptors. So the virus is filling up the kidneys as well as the uh, lungs and the gut. What about COVID-19 and tomatoes? Well, I don't know about this. I was referred uh, uh, from uh, an agricultural expert in, in the UK. Um, and uh, the, we're seeing a lot of COVID-19 in countries that produce commercial crops of tomatoes and produce these for export. And the main countries in the world are China, the US, Iran, Italy, and Spain. And what about these countries? They're reporting a lot of COVID-19, aren't they? Tomatoes are ACE inhibitors. In fact, there has been one study of looking at uh, tomatoes and they actually can lower the blood pressure by acting as ACE inhibitors. They also inhibit platelet aggregation. Kiwi fruit apparently can do the same thing. And they act by upregulating ACE2 receptors. Uh, and, and that's how they, um, that's how they, they work. Um, and they also act as angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Now, tomatoes have been studied, but kiwi fruit and walnuts have not. So I, I don't know too much about that, but I did uh, list the top exporting countries uh, for kiwi. Italy is number one, uh, New Zealand, Chile, Greece, and France. Italy is having a problem. And then I listed the top walnut exporting countries, and China is number one. China, number one, US, Ukraine, Chile, and Turkey. So we end up at the end, and that's about uh, talking about these ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And these are very important blood pressure drugs. Uh, and we talked about on an earlier slide how they work. And we're uncertain as to whether they increase the risk of COVID-19. And maybe ARBs, or the angiotensin receptor blockers, by occupying that ACE2 receptor may be protective but it's the ACE inhibitors that um, eliminate the ability of uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme 2 to be that feedback break on the angiotensin uh, vasoconstrictor, which is angiotensin 2. So this is an area of severe controversy um, that we still don't know uh, what the answer is, but there are large ongoing uh, studies in patients right now uh, who are being treated for severe COVID-19 and have been on these drugs, including including me. I'm on an angiotensin receptor blocker called Losartan, and I don't have, um, I'm certainly not going to stop it. It may even be protected. We don't know. Okay, this is uh, the next to last slide, and the next to last slide is debunking the myths about COVID-19. COVID-19 cannot be transmitted in warm, humid weather. Wrong. Anticipate year-round transmission. Hot baths kill COVID-19. Wrong. Hot baths dry your skin. UV light kills COVID-19 virus. Wrong. UV light causes sunburn and skin cancer. Hair dryers kill COVID-19. Nope. Hair dryers dry your hair. COVID-19 cannot be transmitted when it's snowing. Wrong. Anticipate year-round transmission. COVID-19 virus is transmitted by mosquitoes. Nope. It's not an orthopod borne virus. Rinsing your nose with saline kills COVID-19. Nope, but it can introduce brain-eating amoeba. Next, eating garlic prevents COVID-19. Nope, but gar do garlic does potentiate anticoagulants like aspirin. Next, taking, COVID taking antibiotics prevents COVID-19. Nope. Antibiotics can predispose you to resistant infections, and antibiotics don't work against viral diseases. The only exception may be azithromycin. 
Last, getting flu and pneumonia vaccines prevent COVID-19. No, but these are very important things to do because they're important diagnoses to rule out. Last slide, what we don't know about SARS-CoV-2. We don't know the intermediate zoonotic source. I don't know, anteaters, snakes, we don't know. Birds, reptiles, other reptiles. The true efficacy of transmission is unknown. Remember the choir cluster. It looks like respiratory droplet transmission is more important than fomite transmission. The real pathogenicity of the virus is unknown. What does that mean? How many viral particles known as virions does it take to make you sick? One, probably not one, more than one, hundreds, thousands, we don't know. The precise incubation period is unknown, although we're getting closer and closer to saying it's three days. The number of infectious asymptomatic patients is unknown. We're not gonna know this until we, until we start testing more people. The true case fatality rate is unknown, but it's higher in elderly and those with comorbidity. And what did I tell you about the case fatality rate in Louisiana? It's the highest in the country, it's around 4.2%, whereas overall, the case fatality is less than 1%. The risk of reinfection, we've had a few infections. People are COVID positive, become COVID negative, and then get sick again and COVID positive again. That's rare. Um, and recrudescent means a late reinfection. We don't know too much about why this is happening and how infectious these individuals are. And finally, we really don't know the risks posed by the ACE2 upregulators, including the foods and the drugs. Um, which was the last item of controversy we, we addressed. So I hope I've answered uh, a lot of the questions. At least I've tried to answer some of the ones that were sent and written in. And, um, and I look forward to any, any further questions from, from the audience. Thank you. Can you hear me? Everything okay? Can hear. Fabio, did I you, come across? Thank you. You're on, Fabio. Okay, very good. So, well, it's um, although we had some technical difficulties uh, at the beginning, I think the two presentations went extremely well. The iconography and the information was amaz amazingly useful. <clears throat> uh, so, I think we have a few questions from the audience. <clears throat> some are generic. Uh, very useful question for the for everybody uh, present in the audience uh, and everybody out there. And I think our speaker anticipated the answers of these questions, but um, I would like to repeat a few um, so they stay on record. And I would like uh, probably I will uh, I will proceed in a chronological order. Some are, are generic about survival of the virus. Some refer to the pathogenesis and maybe the, the spread of the disease. And some refer to transmission and um, other refer to respirator and treatment. And, and there is another one also particularly interesting, which is a little bit delicate. I will try to be as diplomatic as possible, which refer to the publication of data from the various countries. Again, all these uh, presentation opinions from the illustrious colleagues and um, faculties don't represent LSE opinion, just represent our best guesses and um, based on scientific uh, data and our personal opinion. So I would like to start with, this, with the first question. So that's a very practical question. If someone purchased frozen food from a store, and the coronavirus is on the package. How long can it survive on the package in the freezer? It's about survival of the virus once the, the meat or the veggies or whatever the product is, is packed and then put in the freezer. How long is the virus surviving the freezer? I would have an answer based on common sense, but I would like to hear the virologist opinion on this one. Am I? 
Am I unmuted? Um, yes, you are. Yes, you are unmuted. Well, we know the disease can be transmitted in cold weather and under um, freezing conditions. Um, exactly how long uh, it can remain on the package uh, depends on how many virions were transmitted to the package by the COVID positive patient. Example, if the patient had just sneezed in their hand and grabbed the package, uh, then we have a large number of virions on the package and we would expect um, that at least under normal temperature, they could, could, could remain stable in the environment and capable of replication at least for a few hours on a, a waxy surface, for example. But to say exactly, you know, how long uh, the virus could remain capable of replication is unknown. And people always use the term, you know, is the virus alive or not? A virus needs to, to live in the host. Some viruses are environmentally stable uh, outside, and this one appears to be a very stable uh, virus outside of the of the host, whether it's an animal host or a human host. And also, the surface on which the virus is deposited is very important. If the surface uh, has a lot of uh, holes in it and places for the virus to hide, uh, cloth surface compared to say a flat or stainless steel or metal or plastic surface, it, it may remain capable of replication on that surface for a longer period of time. This is one of the reasons why we're recommending uh, when you're out in the community and, and touching things, inanimate objects, that, that you wash your hands as soon as you can, or if you don't have access to soap and water, that you use uh, a hand sanitizing solution. Yeah, I agree with that. So um, one thing to take into account, and it's a, it's a little thing, it sounds like a big thing, but it's actually a little thing. If you, uh, if you have a droplet full of coronavirus and it goes in the freezer and it freezes and then it unfreezes, that freeze thaw actually ruptures some of the virions. So uh, that takes the titer or the amount of infectious virus down about twofold. That sounds like a lot, but uh, so you have half as much virus. But when you have a million particles, now you're down to 500,000. So uh, freeze thawing is not the way to neutralize this virus, but it does have an effect. Uh, soap is the way to go. Thank you. Um, next question would be. Are the symptomatic patients usually young or old? So it's a question about age. And can they transmit the virus for 14 days or longer? Any comment about this? Yes. Um, we know that uh, young people can become COVID positive and they can be very communicable, communicable even before they develop uh, symptoms at about three or four days. They can, they can transmit the virus even earlier than when they first um, display symptoms. We know that older people um, over 60, 65 are at greater risk and risk increases with age, particularly in people who have coexisting diseases and these diseases can be cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, heart failure, prior heart attack, and especially diabetes and kidney disease. We also know that people who may be younger than age 60 or 65 who have some of these comorbidities can also be uh, at risk of developing severe COVID-19, and I didn't include in that list of coexisting conditions, COPD, but lung disease is very important too. And we're very concerned about our situation in Louisiana, where we have a high case fatality rate. And that can be explained by having a, 
a population that does have a lot of obesity, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease. Thank you. Um, and I know you covered this, uh, but there is a direct question about, about uh, uh, the strain severity and uh, related uh, symptoms and clinical manifestations. So which are the differences in symptoms and clinical manifestations uh, for the more severe strains? Since you already mentioned well, that, the of an S strain and an L strain. Yes, and I always get them confused, which one's which. But for the ancestral strain, the most severe strain, uh, this is the one that's going to cause more symptomatology. And that symptomatology, almost like the index patient, it's going to be um, low-grade fe grade, grade fever, scratchy throat, uh, moving to a sore throat, a very dry cough where you're not producing anything, um, a basically a, a hacking cough associated with pain in the chest and then developing a sort of air hunger or shortness of breath and painful breathing. And these could be the earlier manifestations of a more severe strain that could be associated with some abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. We tend not to see a lot of diarrhea uh, in uh, COVID-19, but we do see a lot of diarrhea in SARS and a lot of diarrhea in MERS. So uh, that's possible too. In the less severe strains, uh, it may simply be um, almost like a, a hay fever or a scratchy throat and a runny nose and maybe no fever. Remember, in the first 1,000 Chinese cases, 48% uh, presented with fever and, and more, you know, 52% had no fever. So the less severe strains, maybe no fever, runny nose, scratchy throat. It gets well rapidly. Thank you very much. And there is a, one of the participants of this, um, one of the attendees that is, um, would like some uh, some comment about the 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 story the the pathogenesis uh, about the the event uh, on the choir uh, about the transmission of um, of the disease in that case. Um, yes. So the, if you can, if you could a little bit recapitulate the events of that. Uh, situation so the people came and had their um, rehearsal and um, and then they went home and uh, so how long did it take to the disease to develop and how the the investigators uh, decided that uh, about the incubation times and then the manifestation the clinical signs yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, that has not been reported in the literature. It's only been reported in the lay press. So I can, I can only um, tell you what's available in the lay press. Apparently, last month, uh, around uh, March 20th or so, uh, a group of choir members from a church in a town outside of Seattle, Washington, decided to get together for practice. And this was a relatively large group. In other words, there were 60 people. And I'm not sure if that's when the recommendation for avoiding groups larger than 10 had been made or, or not. But this was a large group that got together in a church and uh, began uh, singing together, and one of the members described it as a huggy experience. I'm not sure what that means, but the, the individuals were in close contact, and they were singing. And we know this. Uh, we know that slow motion video has shown that patients talking, coughing, yelling, singing, sneezing, 
can actually propel uh, respiratory droplets uh, for significant distances up to six feet before gravity will pull the droplets down to the ground. So these individuals were within six feet of contact. Obviously, there were patients within the choir who were COVID positive, maybe in early phases of disease, and were communicable, but may not have been experiencing symptomatology at that time. Then uh, everybody went home from the practice, and within a period of time, actually the, the press said within three weeks, and we can, we can uh, dissect that time period in, in a second. Within a period of time, 45 of the 60 people, that's a very high number of that group, tested positive for COVID-19, and two patients died. So uh, if we look at that period, we could say that there were some attendees of choir practice who were communicable. And then uh, they passed that infection to a large number of members. And those members with an average incubation of say four days, were totally asymptomatic for about four days and then developed maybe a runny nose, a scratchy throat, depending on the strain of virus. And they continued with that probably for a period of another eight, 10, or 12 days. So if we add that together, we're about 16, 17 days out. So before people would become highly symptomatic with severe COVID-19 and require a hospitalization. So the time frame makes sense and the transmissibility makes sense. And it, it is a, basically it's a natural experiment, albeit a tragic experiment, where we seem to have confirmation of a respiratory droplet preferred form of transmission as being a more communicable form of transmission compared to uh, transmission from fomites or in inanimate objects. So that's about as much as I can say about it until the event is actually published as a, as a case study. Another medical question, and then we'll switch to a couple of questions about uh, animals for Professor Baines. A quick one, do you think your blood type have an effect on your chance of getting uh, uh, this virus? Uh, I'm sorry, Did, would you repeat that one? Was it for yes, shot? Gl gl gladly repeat it. Uh, is there any relationship between uh, the human blood type and the chances uh, uh, of um, certain blood types individual to get um, easily the virus? Any relationship between uh, blood type and uh, infection? You know, there are uh, some infectious diseases um, that uh, are more susceptible to patients with certain blood types. Um, and I can't really answer that. There are conditions that are very common in Italy, for example, uh, which are called the hemoglobinopathies. Uh, thalassemia is one. And this may increase susceptibility by virtue of reducing uh, immunocompetency or the ability of the immune system to fight disease. So that's related to the type of uh, red blood cells in a hemoglobinopathy. Now, in terms of the, the blood types, um, the most common blood type are gonna be blood types like O and, um, and A positive, and the, and the less common blood types are gonna be um, the AB negative and the AB positive. So I can't really comment on that. Um, but I know that that has been 
has been brought up, um, and there are some diseases uh, of the blood that would reduce immunocompetency and make you more at risk. Uh, Professor Baines, uh, um, thank you for waiting. Um, uh, would you like to comment about uh, sensitivity of um, animals toward the virus, uh, especially related to pets and production animals from the preliminary studies uh, and reports that have been so far? Some are confusing. Um, um, some, some, it seems that some animals just got exposed and uh, passively harbored the virus in their um, upper respiratory tract with no clear replication. Would you like to mention uh, about what we know so far? Thank you. Sure, so um, there, these are just out. So actually the Journal of Virology paper just appeared uh, yesterday. Uh, and there is a unreviewed paper um, from China in BioArchives and, and you can, BioArchives is free uh, access, so you can get that and look at it. Um, the bottom line is in the BioArchives bio paper, um, what they did is they put 100,000 infectious particles in the nose of cat and uh, basically measured the cat's ability to um, its clinical signs, fever, et cetera, and also whether it got infected. And it was clear, at least with that dose, that the cat did get infected. So um, that's consistent with the Belgian cat where you had a sick COVID person whose cat got sick. Um, however, uh, then, the, then they put the cat in a cage, uh, an isolation cage, which other cats and um, to ask whether that cat could be infectious for other organisms, for other animals. Um, and one of those cats, those sentinel or contact cats did get um, infected. Two others did not. So it, coming out of cats is actually very inefficient. The problem with the study is uh, 100,000 particles, it's unclear how that um, correlates with real droplet amounts. So uh, if you force it, you can get a cat infected and you know a COVID-19 patient like in Belgium is probably secreting a lot of virus and a lot of people like to kiss their cats and, uh, and cats are very fastidious animals as you know. If you sneeze on a cat, it's going to groom itself uh, and so they're uh, susceptible that way, but it's really unclear at this point how often this happens in the field. Now, the bioarchive study also tested a number of other species. They looked at dogs. Um, there was no evidence whatsoever that dogs would get infected. They looked at ferrets. Ferrets, uh, some people have ferrets as pets. Those uh, were highly infected, infectable. Um, they didn't do transmission studies with ferrets. And, and they checked pigs and ducks. And I may be missing a species, but uh, they were, there was no evidence of infection of those animals either. So cats and ferrets seem to be the stalwart ferrets are, was much more convincing, but again, we need more data, we need more animal testing to find out in the field exactly how common this is in COVID-19 patients. The Journal of Virology study just showed that the, the receptors, the ACE2 receptors that Dr. Diaz talked about were similar in cats and people. So that is, in, is consistent with uh, that study, with the bioarchive study. Fabio, can I can I jump in? I think it uh, is probably time to wrap up, unless you have one final pressing question. Well, there is a very interesting question that involves uh, people and veterinarians that uh, would be nice uh, to Professor Baines uh, to address, and actually also from Professor Diaz then to follow up. Um, we all know that we are surrounded by um, coronaviruses. 
We all know that uh, our production anim animals are, are shedding coronaviruses all the time and our pets uh, are uh, all in their intestine slowly replicating non-pathogenic for us coronaviruses. So is there any chance that uh, people that are exposed to, to animal coronavirus would uh, react differently to this disease? Generic question, but obvious, considering that we got a large audience uh, of pet lovers and veterinarians. So your average kitten will get a coronavirus episode sometime before the time it's a year old. Um, this is also, if you have a pet pig, it's the same thing. Um, and your puppy is going to see coronavirus at some point. There's no evidence whatsoever that those viruses transmit to people or, or predispose people for either in any way that either would make COVID-19 better or worse. They're really, they are in the same family, but their proteins are so different that the antibodies do not cross react well. Excellent, and uh, the truly last question, so we then we follow the suggestion of our leadership, uh, Dean Delia, to come to an end of this interesting conversation. Uh, so um, are the world uh, data available about this disease uh, regarding um, uh, death, uh, first of all, illnesses and uh, non-clinically presenting disease patients? Are the data uh, as a gut feeling or as a, as a um, uh, detection of impression overestimated or underestimated? Well, in the absence of more widespread testing, uh, we are underestimating the number of COVID positive patients. And we are only using the models of the um, curves that I showed, the epidemic curves and the impact of social distancing and stay at home isolation to predict the number of deaths. So the problem is we're underestimating the number of potentially communicable cases and our estimate for the number of deaths is based on models alone and uh, hopefully it's going, going to be um, as close as possible but may still be an underestimate. Thank you. Professor Fabio, is, is you. there enough time for me to make one comment about the uh, exposure to other coronaviruses? Please. Uh, that's a very good question, not with regard to animal coronaviruses, but we know that the alpha coronaviruses cause about 30% of common colds. And who gets common colds all the time? Kids, they always have runny noses. Uh, and, you know, up until about preteen years. And we're, we are finding few cases of, although there have been some, of COVID-19 disease in children. And we think the re reason is twofold. One, they formed antibodies to a lot of these alpha coronaviruses, and there's some degree of cross protection by these antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And two, kids do not have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, unless they have type one diabetes, renal failure, uh, they don't have the number of ACE2 receptors for the COVID-2 virus to attach to that adults have, particularly elderly patients or patients who have hypertensive cardiovascular disease. So we think that these are the two mechanisms that offer protection for children. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting, important information. Um, we, we cover all the questions uh, that um, that we we receive uh, um, and that had uh, wide interest. There were also some specific questions uh, for uh, 
for reason of time, we couldn't answer those. Uh, they can be also addressed to the to the panelists directly via email. Uh, the websites are available, and um, now you all know them. You know them. Um, and I would like to give the opportunity for the concluding remarks to uh, Dean Christopher Delia, Professor Delia, that is uh, it is the main organizer of this event. Professor Delia, please. Uh, thank you very much, Fabio. And I, I want to thank uh, Joel and Jim very much for really excellent presentations. As I said, we're recording this and we'll make it available. Uh, for security reasons, the access was closed down too tight and many people didn't get on. And that does uh, uh, concern me a little bit, but we will have this recorded and upload it as soon as we possibly can so that we can uh, make it available to everybody that was unable to get on. Kathy, can you advance the slide? So we have uh, some resources that we want to um, share with you if uh, you haven't seen them or are unaware of them, but there are some terrific websites out there with lots of information about the coronavirus, including a couple of just wonderful tracking tools, the Johns Hopkins Universal University one that most of us go to every day, and the one coming out of the University of uh, Washington, which is the bottom one. They're excellent, and they provide a lot of information on how well we're flattening the curve. And then finally, the last slide, I, I'm going to do a little shameless advertising. If, if people are interested in these topics, uh, LSU and uh, LSU A&M and, and, uh, and LSU uh, Health in New Orleans have a number of uh, collaborations. And uh, these lead to fast track and joint degrees that will link in environment and public health, um, veterinary medicine and, and, and the MPH, et cetera, social work and master of public health. They're wonderful opportunities, and I think they're emblematic of the kind of trends we're seeing in, in education these days where we are crossing the lines that were traditionally um, uh, very solid. We are now have, having blurred lines and lots of interdisciplinary activities. Uh, it's fun putting the, uh, a group together like this because all it does is raises more possibilities and gives us more ideas. So uh, with that, I thank, thank everybody for all the hard work that they did, that Kathy and her crew, and uh, Kathy Falls and her crew, and, and just everybody has been most cooperative and helpful in doing this. Uh, we'll get the technology down better when you do a Zoom for 500 people, it's not easy. And with that, I'll close it out and, and thank you all very much. <laughs>